We're now going to move into our first panel. How do we design and build an effective and robust uh, colorectal cancer screening program? And I'm delighted to introduce the, the person who's going to give us a perspective, and that's Dr. Dominika novak Mlaka, the head of the colorectal cancer screening program from Slovenia. We just heard Samo's experience from the SFIT, the experience of receiving the invitation, going through the process, getting a diagnosis and early treatment and care. And you're, of course, someone who's responsible for actually managing that process. So, Dominika, let's hear from you. What does it take to create a robust and effective colorectal cancer screening program? Thank you for invitation and opportunity to present Slovenia experience with colorectal cancer screening. And yes, we are very lucky to have this kind of uh, representative as some. In 2009, Slovenia launched the National Colorectal Cancer Screening Program with the name Program Suite. It is a population-based program, nationally organized and centrally managed. The immunochemical fecal occult blood test is used as a screening test. Target population covers 600,000 people aged between 50 and 74 with compulsory health insurance. Coverage of the target population by invitation is more than 99%. The program algorithm is designed as user-friendly and as simple as possible for all procedures that must be performed by the participants. Most procedures can be performed by participants at home. The significant part of communication with the target population is done by regular mail. Participants receive an invitation. Those who choose to participate return a letter with a written statement of participation to the program central unit. Test kits for sample collection are sent by mail from program central unit. Samples are returned by mail to a central laboratory and analyzed the same day. All participants and their GPs receive a test result. Participants with a positive test are referred to colonoscopy and those with a negative test receive an invitation to screening in two years time. Participants' responses are monitored, invitation and reminders are sent. Special attention is given to disabled people. Slovenian guidelines for early detection for the cancer were published in 2016. Next slide, please. The Minister of Health established the screening program and the Health Insurance Institute provides financial resources. The National Institute of Public Health is the responsible authority for correct cancer screening. In the program can central unit, in-house mailing services handles outcoming and incoming mails. In the central laboratory, all stool samples are anal analyzed. Call centers is responsible for colonoscopy appointments, organization, and ordering. Once the patient has a positive fit, a general practitioner is actively included in the preparation for colonoscopy. The physician assesses whether a patient is able to undergo colonoscopy, fills out the referral form for procedure, and prescribes a colon cleansing medicine. Sweet ambassadors, as for example, SAMO, patients who have already participated in the program are also involved and are important in promotional activities. GPS teams are involved in communication with non-responders and ask to promote the program. After each screening round, GPS receive a few indications of their patient's performance in the screening program. Next slide, please. Colorectal the Cancer Expert Council and the Program Central Unit are responsible for the development and implementation of program guidelines, clear inclusion criteria for target population, preparation of standard uh, procedures, following the quality indicators, and also for quality control, accreditation system, education and training pro of programs providers. Next slide, please. Here is an example how we follow the quality control among gastroenterologists who are participating in cancer screening. Quality indicators for colonoscopy are used in all the supervision visits which are performed in colonoscopy centers every one to two years. With quality indicators, colonoscopies are informed with achievements of their work and with various changes. They can monitor the indicators through screening program on an application and compare their results with results on national level. In a similar way as for colonoscopists, quality indicators are also monitored in pathologists. Next slide, please. For correct cancer screening, the opinion of, of patients who participate is very important. Information on patients' pain experience during colonoscopy is gathered through anonymous post-colonoscopy questionnaire 
It includes data on colonoscopy provider and institution where the procedure was done. Several data from questionnaire are used as a quality indicator during supervision visit in colonoscopic centers. Pain level in patient has changed over time and there were less patients with severe pain in 2020. Quality indicators also show us that approximately 10 to 15% of patients need sedation during the procedure. This information was used in negotiation with police makers and Health Insurance Institute for additional funds to ensure sedation during the chronoscopy procedure. Next slide, please. From the fourth screening round, 600,000 people are invited to the screening program. Up to fifth screening round, 64% of the invitees responded to invitation letter and 60% were screened. 93% of people with a positive screening test completed a colonoscopy. Quality indicators are used for monitoring the results of each screening ground. Next slide, please. According to the Slovenian Cancer Registry, the incidence of oral cancer has been increasing since 1961. The majority of cases were diagnosed in advanced disease stage. Between 2005 and 2009, correct cancer was diagnosed in a local stage in less than 15% of cases. Since 2011, after the first screening round, the Slovenian Cancer Registry has recorded a decrease in correct cancer incidence at the national level. The incidence increased slightly in 2015 as we began to include people up to 74 years of age. The trend of reducing the number of newly diagnosed correct cancers is still ongoing. The removal of precancerous lesions during colonoscopies within the screening program has an important impact on this. Next slide, please. Prior of the implementation of organized population screening, corrector cancer was the second most frequently newly diagnosed cancer. After four screening rounds, corrector cancer slipped to fifth place in frequency. Next slide, please. According to the Slovenian Cancer Registry, the five-year net survival of patients with detected corrector cancer in screening is 30% better than that of cancer detected outside the screening program for the group 50 to 74 years of age. Up to 65% of cancer cases detected in the screening colonoscopies were in an early stage and further oncological treatment was not needed. Next slide, please. When the Slovenian Corrector Cancer Screening Program was established, a communication strategy was designed in order to achieve high screening participation of target population. In epidemic, as of March 16, 2020, all specialist checkups and surgical operations were almost completely canceled in Slovenia. Our screening program came to a standstill for a couple of weeks. By the end of September 2020, all the backlog of colonoscopies was resolved and the program returned back to its normal pace. However, during an epidemic, special effort was made to keep the Slovenian target population well informed of all changes caused by an epidemic. Moreover, in March, the International Month of the Fight Against Colon and Rectal Cancer, media attention was drawn to the importance of the prevention and early detection of the disease. Throughout the following months of the epidemic, the public was being reminded of the importance to participate in all cancer screening programs. The SWIT program conducted also a target communication campaign to increase its visibility. And the last slide, please. From 2009, when the SWIT program was established, the key challenge and aim are to achieve high quality and effectiveness of the program and a high level of trust. It is a great pleasure to know that we have succeeded. The response rate is increasing, the number of new cases is declining, the survival of correct cancer patient is increasing, and the mortality from this type of cancer is reducing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dominica, and very interesting to see both how you managed to adapt the screening process for COVID-19, including offering these certificates so people could move around, um, and also clearly the success rate 
of the screening, I note that there, there was a 30% better survival rate at five years for people whose, whose cancer was diagnosed through the screening process. So it's clear, it's effective, it works, it you know, is a 30% better survival rate. So it, it's a very clear argument about why it should be prioritized. And also I noted with a uh, positive result that colorectal cancer slipped down the list to number five in terms of cancer diagnosis. So that's it's clear, I'm sure that when you go to, to the parliament and to the government to make the case for investing in screening, you've clearly got the data there, I think that shows and justifies it. So thank you very much for sharing the success stories from Slovenia. Thank I'm going you. to now introduce the panel because we'd like to bring in experience from other countries as well. So we have Dr. Carlo Sinori, who is from the Piedmont Regional Cancer Prevention Center in Italy, the University uh, Hospital Città della Salute e della Scienza. We have Dr. Professor Dr. Ulrike Haug, Professor of Clinical Epidemiology and Pharmacoepidemiology at the University of Bremen and the Head of Department of Clinical Epidemiology at the Leibniz Institute for Prevention Research and Epidemi Epidemiology. And he's from Germany. We have Natasha Dagny Pilonis, who's an MD and PhD in the Department of Oncological Gastroenterology, the Maria Curie National Research Institute of Oncology in Warsaw, Poland. And we have Professor Thomas Poskus, Professor of Surgery at Vilnius University and a member of the Coordination Committee of the Colorectal Cancer Screening Program in Lithuania. So we have four other countries where we're going to invite them to share some of their experience. So Dr. Dominika set out how the program is run in Slovenia. What we'd like to ask you, and we have the same questions for all of you is, what are the three key points in your country that you think are needed to have an effective and robust colorectal cancer screening program? So let me start by inviting uh, Dr. Carlo Sonora. For you. We've heard the example from Slovenia. In Italy, which of course is a larger country, it's organized in a different way. You have regional responsibilities for different programs. Tell us what do you think are the three key elements to make a robust and effective colorectal cancer screening program? Uh, thank you, Ross. Thank you for the invitation to uh, cancer. And um, in Italy, the uh, program is uh, implemented at the regional level. Uh, so we have uh, uh, every year a survey of the National Screening Monitoring Center, which is documenting a variability in the level of activity and then the um, result of key performance indicators. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, those programs which are more successful were able to implement an organizational infrastructure which is supporting multidisciplinary collaboration uh, of physicians and uh, health professionals involved in the different steps and in the transition between the steps of the screening process, and also ensure a careful coordination of the management of uh, the patient, which are invited uh, to perform screening and uh, eventually assessment uh, uh, of, in the case of positive result, uh, treatment uh, and uh, follow up. Uh, the other key point is the uh, establishment of an effective governance of the program the possibility to have a well-defined screening protocol defining all the different steps and all the procedures that should be accomplished within each step and also offering a single screening pathway for preventive activities reorienting all early detection uh, examination within the program to avoid duplication of effort and the competition with opportunistic screening which is uh, uh, reducing the efficiency of the approach you, uh, using a single pathway, you can optimize the utilization of limited resources, endoscopy resources in particular, which are in fact a barrier to the diffusion of screening, the lack of resources. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, they were able to establish a monitoring system of the program performance, which is based on a comprehensive screening registry, which can support audit and guide uh, uh, continuous quality improvement of the program inform public health decision making and also uh, provide information uh, for the citizens that we've seen for Slovenia it is important to inform and communicate the result of the program to the uh, people which is who are invited to uh, increase awareness and support their participation thank you very much uh, Dr Carlo Sonori and for sharing your experience from from Italy for the audience, we're delighted to hear from you and please put your questions in the Q&A section. 
And uh, Dominica, I can see that we have three questions already for you. If you are able to type the answers, that would be extremely helpful because we have, we'll, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions and, and speakers to get through. We may not have time for me to ask you those questions live, but if you're able to answer them in the chat, then everyone will, will see them. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to um, Professor Ulrike Haug from Germany, another larger country, another country with a uh, federal decentralized system of health. What is your view? What are three elements that you need to think about when you design and build effective and robust CRC screening programs? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we're looking at the experience in Germany, I think, uh, so the epidemiology of colorectal cancer shows that it goes in the right direction, incidences are declining. Uh, but the question is also, is it robust, is it effective, what we are doing? And uh, here I see a, quite a lot of room for improvement. Uh, so, what does not exist in our country is an invitation system that has a kind of memory. So, people are simply invited at certain ages, 50, 55, 60, 65, without considering what has been happened in between, uh, so based on prior findings, based on uptake of diagnostic colonoscopies. So, I think this is something that could make much more effective uh, and efficient as well. Um, it, align, uh, along with that, the uh, problem is also that there is no system that makes sure that people with a positive fecal or cult blood test uh, indeed undergo uh, diagnostic colonoscopy, so are followed up. And this is a low hanging fruit. I think this is something that should be uh, solved. Uh, so, uh, this is, I think, uh, out of question that this is a, a problem if it's not um, handled. Now, uh, another issue I see is uh, to uh, we should reach a better understanding of non-participation. Uh, so and this goes in the same direction that Carlo mentioned, this monitoring. And I think monitoring should also include characterization of non-participants in terms of where could they be reached, how could they be reached, what are the barriers. And uh, so simply reporting the proportion of participating in screen colonoscopy and so on uh, it's not so informative, but uh, we don't send test kits to persons. So, and if this is the thing that would be needed to increase participation overall, um, to have a easy access for a higher proportion of the population, then it would be good to know. But uh, as long as we don't have a better, more data on non-participants and uh, their barriers, it's difficult to decide. Thank you. So have I understood it correctly that test kits are not sent to people at home? You understood correctly, they are not sent. Yeah. So how do they get them? Uh, so uh, they can get them through, uh, through the physician. So they, they go to the physicians. It's all, it's, it's all organized uh, for the physicians, actually. So people get an irritation letter with more or less just information on colorectal cancer screening. And... Uh, then the next step would be to uh, to see a physician. Right, okay. Because here in Belgium, I, I received a letter at home that invited me to go and pick up a test kit from the local pharmacy. So it, there is a two-step process here. And so now I understand that's how it works in Germany as well. Thank you. Let's hear some experience from Poland now. Uh, and um, Professor Natasha Pilonis, tell us in, in your view, what are the three things that make an effective and robust CRC screening program? Thank you, Thompson. I'm, I'm very happy to share the, the Polish experience here. And um, I think that, uh, well, um, I picked uh, three of the most important key, like key factors because we know that the, the screening concept and screening process is an extremely multifactorial thing. But what I think is, um, I would say as a, at the first place, I think that, uh, that uh, the population-based uh, a screening program at the national level um, it's uh, it's an extreme it's an of extreme importance especially in Poland and especially uh, nowadays when uh, when there is so much inconsistency and doubt um, about healthcare and about healthcare policy people um, do not trust the government that much uh, as in the past. So I think that uh, like homogeneous policy, uh, well, uh, when at the national level, when we send the people a um, very clear message and we all uh, agree that this is the right thing to do, it's, uh, it's extremely important. 
Uh, the second thing that I would say is, uh, is this continuous uh, quality assurance uh, assurance program. And here I would love to go to, to the to the third point because uh, um, as my as previous speakers said, uh, this uh, this monitoring is crucial and I would like to love to emphasize one thing here. Uh, screening, colorectal cancer screening uh, is, uh, is a great thing to do, but we offer people, healthy people, an intervention. Um, and in terms of uh, colonoscopy-based screening programs, but also I, I believe that this is very important for, uh, for FIT-based programs, we, at some point, we offer patients an invasive procedure, which is a colonoscopy. And we have to make sure that, uh, that this will be effective and safe. I think this is extremely important uh, because those people are not coming to us and they're not telling, hey, I want to be screened. I have this problem. I have some, uh, some symptoms. No, we are taking people. This is our initiative. We are offering something to, to healthy people uh, without, uh, without any symptoms. So I think that, uh, that this is extremely important in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, quality assurance uh, to provide safety, but effectiveness. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha. Let me now invite the last member of our panel, that's Professor Thomas uh, Pushkush from Lithuania to also share his experience. What three things make uh, colorectal cancer screening effective and robust? Uh, I think three important points is a national system or a regional system, but robust based on uh, local or national government regulations, meaning that these regulations are set and these regulations should be adhered to. Uh, the second is of course sufficient funding because this is a costly initiative and, and the funding should be uh, sufficient and, and recurrent and uh, not based on, on some political uh, outcomes uh, of one way or the other. And the third point, I think, is the robust data management system so that we clearly know what happens to the person who was invited to screening uh, to the end of his uh, participation in screening. So every uh, single moment should be accounted for. And uh, uh, as was nicely presented from Slovenia, uh, every participant in the screening program should uh, be aware uh, of what is going on, but but there is an organization, the oversight organization that should monitor the quality of colonoscopy, the quality of uh, referral for colonoscopy and uh, the outcomes and um, audits. And that is probably the most important thing for the successful colonoscopy screening uh, for colorectal cancer screening program. Thank you very much. So we've heard experience there from different countries about you know uh, different quality criteria around you know the efficiency about follow up about institutional memory about being proactive about sending the test kits um, and understanding what some of the barriers are making sure that the the regulations are well understood and adhered to so you have quality criteria we're getting lots of questions in the chat which is fantastic a, a lot of them are specific to dominica so maybe we'll have a chance to pick up on some of these um, but let me now um, invite our, our panel to think about two actions that need to happen, either at European or national level, in order to, to make the, the screening better. But and while you're thinking about that, Dominica, can I ask you to pick up on a, a couple of, I think, practical questions? We've had a question, are, are clients in, in mental institutions or elderly institutions invited as well? Um, and, you know, how do... GPs and previous participants promote screening amongst non-participants. And this is because often people who are non-participants uh, are hard to reach, they're lower socioeconomic status and they use their GPs less. So how do you engage people like um, Samo to ambassadors to get to them? So Dominique, do you want to reply to those two? Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. As I mentioned in my presentation, we take care uh, especially take care of the people with different um, uh, uh, disabilities. We also invite people from the home, from the elderly home, and people from different kinds of institutions. Because we think in our law, they also have a um, uh, right to participate. And if they need some um, 
some some uh, support. Um, they have uh, some people who follow them uh, to the um, colonoscopy, uh, proceed, uh, 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 gastroenterologists and also nurses are prepared for this kind of uh, situation. And there is no ob obstacle if somebody has any kind of disease, any kind of uh, obstacles that he or she uh, would not participate at the screening colonoscopy. Um, what is uh, regarding the non-participants, uh, uh, non uh, um, uh, at the GPs, uh, three times per year, we're sending out the list of uh, non-participants to the GPs. So they are informed which of their patient is not participating in the screening. And we ask them that they should contact these non-participants. They have several opportunities. Let's say they, them, uh, they can contact them by phone or by letter that is written by uh, general practitioners because we know from different kinds of research that people very uh, trust their GPs. So we think if they didn't respond to the screening invitation, perhaps the uh, invitation from the general practitioner will change their decision and they can participate. Then the general practitioner also have a, an opportunity to send uh, to these non-responders a community nurse. And because sometimes people are convinced that they have now enough knowledge to fill out the um, uh, invitation letter, or they have some obstacles to collect samples, or they have some disabilities and they, they, they are convinced that uh, it is too hard to complete the procedure. And there are some opportunities that GP has to include as much as possible non-responders in the, the corrective cancer screening. And um, I think um, that um, also the promotional activities and community uh, um, level it is very important that they are invited to speak loud about the importance to be part of the screening. So, okay. but we still have challenges in the future. We want to come from 65% response rate, where are we now, to 70% and we have to do a lot of work. Thank you very much, uh, Dominica. Lem, and I, I note that we have a couple of questions already coming in in the chat that I will bring in to our, our different speakers. Um, and we, we've already had another question that's been answered. Carlo, let me come to you. What needs to happen at either national or European level to improve the colorectal cancer screening in Italy? Well, I think that there are already uh, initiatives going on also in Italy. We realize that uh, there is a, a, a problem to, uh, related to um, the experience, the competence of uh, health professionals participating in screening. We need to improve uh, to effort uh, aimed to capacity building, uh, in particular to promote uh, uh, opportunities for multidisciplinary collaboration between, uh, it's important to have a collaboration, for example, between uh, um, endoscopies, pathologists, and surgeons to appropriately manage the patient who are undergoing assessment and to avoid uh, uh, over treatment uh, uh, and uh, eventually uh, also over diagnosis. So this is uh, uh, this, uh, building this uh, competence about uh, multidisciplinary activities. Uh, also, for example, in the, um, at the organizational level, uh, bringing together the uh, cleaning staff and the clinician who are involved in the management of the patient is also important to ensure that the flow of the patient is uh, appropriate, that the patient is appropriately informed and they can follow the procedure, for example, for bowel preparation, which I've seen uh, uh, that is a, a problem for many patients. So uh, this is one uh, key issue. And the other one is uh, to um, support and uh, implement and improve uh, the uh, ability uh, to monitor the, the activity also at the uh, national but also at the European level. Uh, having uh, data about the performance of different cleaning programs can uh, provide opportunities for benchmarking, can uh, offer opportunities also to, to share experience and to uh, compare these experience. 
and uh, I think that networking activities at the European uh, level, we have seen that these are very useful at the national level, uh, networking across the program, and also European level can be a, a support, can be an initiative that can favor the achievement of uh, the goal we are all aiming at, the quality of the program. Uh, thank you for that. Um, let me now bring in Ulrika, and we actually have a question, a direct question uh, for you in, in the chat that says, do you know what the coverage of the eligible population and what percentage of the invited population actually undertakes screening? So that's the first question for you. I have to unmute. <laughs> so, yeah, so the coverage first, uh, the invitation is sent out by health insurances and everybody has a health entrance in Germany. So uh, regarding invitation, there's a full coverage. Everybody gets an invitation since 2019 only actually. Um, now regarding the uptake, uh, I would just then post a recent paper we have published on, uh, it's, uh, it's about to be published on the uptake of screening colonoscopy. Uh, and I think it's important because we looked at both screening colonoscopy in the past 10 years and diagnostic colonoscopy in the past 10 years. So screening colonoscopy is only half of the colonoscopies that are done. Uh, when you only look at screening colonoscopy, then the 10 year prevalence is at ages 60 to 74, about 20, 23%. But when you look at all colonoscopies, it goes up to 50%. So there are a lot of other colonoscopies done in Germany. And uh, um, it's more difficult to get good data on fecal local blood testing. There has also been a change from chief FOBT to FIT uh, in 2019. And uh, at the moment, I don't have good data on FIT uptake. So uh, for chief FOBT estimates for about 20 to 30% in addition to colonoscopy. Um, but it's assumed that this is an underestimation because the chief FOB has been so cheap that it has often not been reimbursed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we will have better data for FIT, but I, I don't have yet. So as soon as I have something, I can provide you with that. Thank you, Ulrika. Let me ask you a question that's come up in the chat, and I, I'm inviting other panel members to also uh, comment on this as well. Uh, somebody said, what about people who are homeless or undocumented migrants or people who move around a lot? I mean, everything we've heard here about the screening process involves a registered address where you can receive a letter or you can have a follow-up letter sent to you, et cetera. But there are proportions of the population for whom they don't have a permanent address. Um, they, they might move around a lot. They might be you know, in a domestic violence refuge. They might be in and out of prison. They might be homeless or on the street. There's large numbers of people who don't fall into the category of having a fixed permanent address, but who would still need to be involved in the screening. And I don't know if you or Rico or any member of the panel has any suggestion about how you reach out to this group who are unreachable via a letter sent to a fixed address. If I may, it is a problem yes. that, that we find in, in our system and uh, uh, it might be possible to create a way for a common screening maybe. Uh, but it is actually a difficult problem. The other difficult problem we face is the GDPR and data safety. So even for that, for a registered person, we have to take their data from the, from the population registry uh, with the medical intention. And that, is, uh, that creates a conflict of data safety, in, at least in our country. But I'm sure it's a similar situation uh, elsewhere too. Uh, so not only people who have who do not have a registered address, but even those who have registered address, we have to um, uh, assess their data with with an intent they might not be interested in. So that that is also a little bit of a of a, of a conflict here. Thank you, Thomas. I hadn't thought of that. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you. And um, Iga has mentioned that, you know, one of the reasons for the low answer to invitation in Poland was the wrong address. So precisely this, this loop that if you're relying on the postal address, we may miss people. Does anyone else on the panel want to pick up either on the point that Thomas just said about this GDPR and the collecting of data for a different intention, if this is a, a challenge? Well, yes. I, uh, this, is a, this is a challenge. But I just want to mention briefly that the issue of people who cannot be easily reached, these uh, 
um, for example, uh, homeless or immigrant. I think that to this, uh, to aim achieving these people, the support of uh, uh, patients organization and non-government non -government organization or volunteers is important because they can reach uh, these, uh, these people. They, the program can uh, uh, take advantage of the collaboration with these uh, groups to reach uh, people who uh, have not a permanent address, for example, so that uh, you can have uh, a support from this uh, uh, collaboration to improve the equity of access to the program, which is one of the also of the indicator which should be monitored in the uh, for the quality of the program to favor the access of all people who uh, should be uh, eligible for screening. Uh, so uh, patient and uh, citizen organization uh, who are working with, uh, for example, immigrant uh, are uh, a, let's say partner of screening programs in this uh, uh, to achieve this goal. Uh, for the GDPR, well, there is, there is a problem. There are different uh, um, interpretation of different application of the GDPR at the, the national level. So it's important to build a, a, to, uh, build a common approach to this, uh, uh, to the utilization of data, which is in the, in the interest of patient to ensure the continuity of care. And so the, at the at national level, there should be rules defined for uh, managing uh, the, the data of the patient. And uh, that, of course, they should comply also with the national legislation. But it's an important step to define a, a protocol for management of data at the local level. That, uh, but it can be, uh, let's say, um, effective management of the data to ensure continuity of care can be achieved using a protocol. Yeah. Thank you. Natasha, can I bring you in on, on these issues? Either you, you can respond to some of the issues we've been talking about, or you can share your insight on what actions need to be done at national European level to improve the situation. Yeah, I hope my answer will cover both, uh, the, both questions. Uh, and um, what I think is uh, it's, it's crucial is to acknowledge the diversity of the population in Europe. Um, I think it's uh, it's an extreme diverse uh, diverse uh, population we have in Europe in terms of uh, culture, uh, finance, or even in the priorities that the, the, the diff different governments have. So I think by acknowledging this diversity, uh, we can um, we can unite in the aim, which is uh, to 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 provide screening. But I think we should be aware that uh, not everywhere the screening um, the screening method, the screening uh, um, outreach uh, can be the same. Uh, what I think it's uh, it's important to uh, to cover people that are unrepresented or are or, or homeless, as you said. As, as we've been discussing before, um, I think, and we have this in Poland, uh, uh, just uh, next to the population-based uh, program, when we send invitation to people who have registered address, we have also opportunistic uh, opportunistic part of this program when uh, when people aged uh, 50, 64 can uh, can schedule their colonoscopy. So I think this is a, as is a good idea for people who who are who wants to be screened um, and, and they can get the screening irrespective of, of getting invitation or not. But please remember that uh, this part, this process requires the initiative and the willingness to be screened. Now, uh, here I would like to go to my second point because to get this willingness of people to be screened and then participation, um, we need to gain the trust of people. So I will come back to the first part I say, um, if the Europe would have a unite, like united, and 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 we could agree on a, on a on a on a fact that screening is important, and we can uh, and we can deliver a safe and effective uh, method uh, methods um, for the diverse uh, for the diverse population. Um, I think it will uh, it will increase the trust, and the trust will increase participation. So I think that this is a quite a, quite a circle that we should uh, that we should follow. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about another five minutes or so on this uh, on this panel, and I think we have 
two elements that have come in from the, the chat that I think are worth exploring. Uh, Gladys says, you know, what are the best practices to motivate individuals who are ambivalent to screening? And then we've had a message from Shlomo who said, well, compliance to fit is quite low, but if you offer uh, colonoscopies as another screening modality or um, and virtual colonoscopy, then people have a bit more of a choice. And he's saying that actually this gives you better compliance. So let me invite the panel, each of you, in just uh, one minute to say, how do we improve motivation? Is it about offering information and a range of options. Natasha, you're on screen. Do you want to start and then we'll yeah. go through the rest of the panel? Yeah, I would love to share uh, our experience from the pilot when we were offering uh, three different strategies for colorectal cancer screening. So um, we thought that the low participation that we have in Poland might be a fact that the colonoscopy is not the best, the, not the most attractive method uh, for the people because it's invasive, requires pr um, preparation and, uh, and contact to the healthcare. Uh, so we performed a randomized uh, trial when we offered people a, a, a choice uh, between colonoscopy and FIT. And also um, there was a group, the third group, uh, because it was a control group when we're inviting people for colonoscopy, then choice, and then like sequential strategy when uh, people were invited for a screening colonoscopy first and those who didn't respond or who didn't agree for colonoscopy were offered FIT. So those uh, both alternative uh, strategies, including FIT were equally, uh, equally, um, equally beneficial and they could increase the participation uh, by uh, 60 70 percent so i think this is uh, this is uh, something that we should uh, keep in mind and this is something that uh, we will use in our uh, in our uh, screening program uh, because we this is a good argument and this is a good uh, evidence-based uh, um, uh, thing to uh, to do to introduce fit in poland great thank you it's very interesting thomas uh, yes, uh, I would compare uh, screening uh, a little bit to COVID vaccination because this is a health intervention to prevent disease. And we can see different rates of participation in different countries, and that is related to cultural, historical, educational, and other, other activities. And I think, uh, I think educating is probably the most important activity to increase participation and also having a valid and functioning system in the country, then we will have good participation rates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ulrika. Yeah, so as it has also been mentioned in the chat, uh, I think uh, not just offering the, the test, but bringing it to the patients, mailing it to them is very quite important. Also nice parallel to the COVID-19 vaccination in federal states in Germany where people have really been so uh, cars have been went into difficult uh, areas and so on. So when you bring the vaccination to the people, the vaccination rate is very high. Um, I think this matters a lot. Thank you. Carlo. Uh, yes, thank you. I think, of course, uh, uh, facilitating the access to the test is important. In, uh, in Piedmont, in particular, for example, we are uh, fo uh, following an approach uh, which is uh, very similar to the one uh, which are uh, which is, has been proposed by uh, Natasha in Poland. We have we started with offering a sequential uh, offer for screening sigmoidoscopy and then uh, fit to those who refuse uh, uh, sigmoidoscopy. It is a combination of two effective tests. Uh, there are different preferences in the population. For example, uh, women prefer to undergo fit while men. Uh, show a high participation for sigmoidoscopy. So we can combine the, um, the, the effect of the protective effect of the two tests and cover a larger proportion of, of population. This is an opportunity in the coronary cancer screening given by the availability of different effective tests and that can be used yep. to improve participation. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Dominica, can I invite you to give us the last message? Yes, we don't have experience what would happen if we offered only colonoscopy to the patients. But I think that uh, when we started to offer opportunity to have a sedation during the colonoscopy, a lot of fear went away because everybody who has to go to colonoscopy thinks I will die, it will hurt, I will never come out of this colonoscopy center. But with this approach that you are looking for the solution, who are um, uh, for uh, for kind to patient, you can solve a lot of obstacles. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for all of you. We, I'm going to bring this first panel to a close and I think you can say we had a really good exchange with the audience and we explored different cultural perspectives, different approaches at national level. And, you know, we've heard examples of what, what has worked, what's been tried. And I think this is extremely helpful.